I am so pumped to be home, y'all. I am so pumped to be home. Let me just say, y'all, we had, it was the first time that we have spent that many days away from our kids and that many days away from our church. It was almost two weeks, 13 days that we were gone. And let me just go ahead and be honest with you because I enjoyed myself while we were gone. But as much as I enjoyed myself on the very first Wednesday, I already started getting homesick. You know why? Because I started getting text messages from my bus kids saying, hey, what time are you going to pick me up today? And I'm like, bro, I got a long drive if I'm going to pick you up today because I'm over on the other side of the world. But actually, Brian's going to come pick you up today. And so I, I was homesick. I missed you guys. Man, I just, y'all, the, the worship that I have experienced the last two weeks was nothing like Claus and worship. Anybody love Claus and worship? It was different. Some good, not some not so good. But it was different, but experiencing that worship, I'm so glad to be home. I do know that you were well taken care of because I got to watch, when we landed in Dallas, I watched both of the services as we were driving back home. Um, how many of you are thankful for Mike? Mike came and he shared just a fantastic word. And then last week we had the OG of Clawson. Give it up for my dad. I'm not sure where he went. Y'all, funny story, I got a, I got a phone call uh, two weeks ago whenever I said dad was the OG of Clawson. I got a phone call and somebody said, hey, so you said the OG of Clawson. Does that mean like the old guy of Clawson? <laughs> and I laughed and I said, well, actually, actually OG means original gangster. In other words, what that means is he was like the founder of it. So I really wasn't talking about him being an old guy. I was, ta- I was giving him honor, not tearing him down. So everybody said, come on, OG. So listen, I honor my dad for all that he has done. He was awesome last week. What a great word. What a great move of the Holy Spirit last week. And so, um, uh, so I'm really, really pumped about this morning. As, um, as Ken stated, I've been on this this committee, this team that's been working on building uh, the future of the AG, what we're doing with the future of the AG. And part of my responsibilities for being on that team was we had to go on this trip. We had to go to Europe. Oh, yeah. We, we had to go on this 13-day trip to Romania and Europe. Uh, the cool part was the district paid for almost all the trips, so that was really cool. Uh, but we did have to go and spend a long time away. What, I want, what we want to do this morning is we want to share with you a little bit about the trips, for, first of all, so that we don't have to do that 157 times. Uh, but second of all, because everybody's already been asking me, hey, man, what happened on the trip? And I'm like, hey, bro, I'm going to tell you Sunday so that I don't have to have this conversation 500 times. Uh, so we're going to share with you a little bit about the trip. And then the purpose of sharing with you a little bit about the trip trip is to share with you what God was doing in us while we were gone. Because I believe God was challenging us with some big things while we were gone. And, and I believe that he wants to challenge you this morning with some of those things. So let me tell you a little bit about the trip. First of all, we got to fly to Romania. Uh, Romania was awesome. I've already got some new friends in Romania. Some of them speak good English. There's a couple of interpreters that I've, I've been on Facebook with. And, uh, and so, in fact, hey, one of them, his name is Dennis. He's called Dinky Rat. I want everybody to say, what's up, Dinky Rat? I'm going to try to get him on the screen to say what's up to you guys in a couple of weeks, but he's, gonna, he's watching our service this morning, so that's going to be a very big deal to him. Uh, but um, anyway, so in Romania, first thing I got to do, and I thought we were doing this later in the week, first thing I got to do was teach at a pastor's conference in, uh, in Romania. Let me just go ahead and say, y'all, where in America, we are, um, we're here where we're at in our church. Mexico is about 40 years behind us. If you go down to Mexico, what you'll see is the church world's about 40 years behind us. If you go to Romania, what you will see is they're about 75 years behind us. And so what I mean when I say that is they take traditional church to a new level for me. So as you can imagine, Romania was a little bit of a challenge for Pastor Josh Pope. So we get to this pastor's conference, and uh, y'all, I'm just going to be honest, it was a lot of fun. Y'all know Josh. I like to challenge people. I like to challenge pastors. So we go in and I'm teaching this workshop on uh, the workshop that they asked me to teach was on um, connecting your church family to your community. So how to pastor the community, how to connect your church to the community. And in Romania, it's, it's um, 
uh, very, church is very different than, they don't do outreach like we do outreach at Clawson. So I'm giving them this workshop on uh, connecting your, your, your church to the community. And it was really, really fun. I begin to share with them our values. And the value that really they had the most questions about was that at Clawson, our church is a battleship, it's not a cruise ship. How many of y'all believe that? How many of y'all believe that? That's not just words that come out of our mouth, but that's actually who we are as a church family. And so our church is a battleship. I begin to elaborate and explain to them how part of the reason that we touch the community the way that we do is because we're not, we're not just people coming and chilling in the chair on Sunday morning. Like we're warriors, we're soldiers that understand that this is a war that we're fighting. And so because it's a war that we're fighting, we don't just come on Sunday morning and chill in the chair. We actually go and we, we, we bring in addicts on Monday night and we give out food boxes on Wednesday night and we go and bust in kids. Like we are warriors fighting a war. Somebody shout amen. amen. And so, uh, so the question came and then it got into some deep discussion. The question that was asked, and I was so grateful that this guy asked the question. He, he raised his hand. And y'all, actually my, my workshop, I, y'all know I'm a challenge people's minds. That's what I do. And so my workshop had so many questions that I finally had to cut them off and tell them it's time to go to the next workshop, which was really cool. But the question that dove into all of the other questions was if our church, if we know that our church is a cruise ship and we hear your heart and we want to move towards being a battleship, how do I as a pastor change the mindsets of myself and my people to create the culture of being a battleship? And so, you know what's so cool? I got to use your stories. You actually preached to the workshop in Romania because I told them how Vicky, it was Vicky's passion to step up and, and do the food boxes and we got to move into the food box ministry and David's passion to kick off the motorcycle ministry and, and, and Jared's passion to kick off most excellent way. And, and I begin to go, you know what? It's, it actually wasn't even me. I didn't even do anything. All I said is we a battleship and they went to war. And so I got to talk to them a little bit about just transforming our mindsets because that's what I want to do is I want to, I want to challenge. Here's what's important to me. It's not important to me what we do. It's important to me why we do what we do. We ask the question all the time in staff meetings, why do we do that? Because if we're just doing it because we've always done it, it's stupid to do it. If what we're doing doesn't have a purpose, then it's probably stupid to waste God's resources on it. And so I, I, I talked about that in the workshop. The workshop was fantastic. I loved it. It was awesome. It was very challenging for them and me. And then on Sunday, y'all, we got to go preach at the Gypsy Church. Let me just go ahead and say, this was not at all what I thought it was going to be. So... Um, on su- Saturday night, we are coming out of, uh, we're headed back to the hotel and Pastor Miha says, hey, um, um, I, I, I want to introduce you to the guy that's going to be interpreting for you at the Gypsy Church. Well, they had told me that I was going to a Gypsy Church. I'm pumped about it. Like, hey, I love uh, crazy people, like different people. That's me. I'm all about that. And so, so, he, and so uh, he said to me, originally, you're a little bit different, and that's why I wanted you to go to the Gypsy Church. I'm like, yes, yes, praise God, amen. And so I, I meet the interpreter, and the, and the interpreter is wearing a three-piece suit. I have swimming shorts on, a t-shirt on, and a backwards hat. And I literally walk up to the interpreter and he's going. And so I said, hey, man, what's up? My name is Josh. And, uh, and, and I'm going to be, are, are you, do you attend the church that I'm preaching? And he says, I'm a deacon at the church that you're preaching at. And he steps back a little bit and I was like, oh, God. I said, okay, so can I ask you a couple of questions just about the church and uh, like what we need to wear and those kind of things? And he says to me, you can Facebook message me those questions. (laughs) Okay. And he says, great to meet you. And he turns and walks off. And I was like, oh, that's the gypsies, huh? So then I message, I Facebook message him and I say, hey man, uh, just so I'm getting clarification, like, uh, what exactly do we need to wear? Does my wife need to have a head covering on? Because they still do that kind of thing. And, and uh, so he messaged me back and he says, you need to look as elegant as you can. 
And yes, your wife needs to have a head covering on as that is our custom. I said, okay, okay. And then he says, also, could you send me your notes that you're gonna preach so that I can make sure that I'm prepared and ready? And it hit me all of a sudden like, oh, this dude's trying to edit my stuff. Like he's gonna try to take out my, no, I ain't sending you my notes. <laughs> you ain't taking out what I'm gonna say. And so, so I, I, uh, I actually tried to send him my notes. It didn't work, so he didn't get the notes. So we, we get in a car to go to the Gypsy Church on Sunday morning. That was my Saturday night experience. Sunday morning, <laughs> we get to the Gypsy Church and we head out. And, and I was told it's a village Gypsy Church. W- w- let me ask you this. When I say a village Gypsy Church, what are you thinking? Wild. You think what? Wild. Wild. I'm thinking probably more casual than your typical, your typical church, huh? It's, they're gypsies, come on. And so, uh, so a little more casual, probably a smaller church. It is, he called it a village church, probably a smaller church, a, a little more casual, although I'm now supposed to look elegant. Well, I didn't bring elegant clothes, y'all. So when we go to the church, I got on blue jeans and I got my 116 jersey on. <laughs> And then I got my, my, I brought a jacket, uh, a suit coat. So I got my suit coat on. So I just got it buttoned up, kind of covering up my jersey. And so, uh, so we, we pull up. This is two hours away. Y'all, it's two, two, you know why they're two hours away? Because the government and the people of Romania hated the gypsies so much that they moved them out where they didn't have to deal with them. Okay, so that's my kind of people. Yeah, except for these people were different than what I thought my kind of people was going to be. So we, we drive up and we're driving for two and a half hours. When, when the pastor told me it's one road in and one road out, dude, one line. Like it's one road. Whoa, way in. Dude's driving 95 miles an hour to get us there on time. We are going. Christy's about to puke in the back seat. And I mean, he is just bobbing and weaving and going. And, and so we get out to the church. The church is huge. I found out later it's the biggest gypsy church in all of Europe. Actually, I found out when we pulled up. <laughs> so I was like, oh, man, took them 10 years to build this building. It's gorgeous. It's huge. We walk into the, the sanctuary. And I'm going to show you a picture of what we, what we saw. Can you put that picture up? Of uh, Yes. Look at this, y'all. It's gorgeous. I mean, they have spent the money on this place. I want you to notice something. I wish I could zoom in. Uh, in, in, the, in the Romanian church, you got all of the men that sit on one side, all of the women that sit on another side, all of the ladies have head coverings, all of the men got suits on. Every one of them. This is not what I was thinking when I was thinking gypsy church. <laughs> so there's like 600 people in the room. We walk in, true story. We walk in, we're standing in our seat and Christy goes, does the guy that's over this trip hate you? <laughs> you remember that? And I said, I don't know why. And she said, why would anyone ask you to come preach out here in this really, really traditional place? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe he's trying to challenge me. <laughs> and so we, we go on with the service and, and, and I look up and y'all know those old school, you can still see them at funeral homes. Those old school pulpits that got like the microphone that comes up like this. So they got the pulpit that's got the microphone up. Every time somebody comes in, it's real weird. Like they play a song and then somebody gets up there and talks for a minute. And then they play another song. And the service was two hours and 42 minutes long, like long. So then they play another song. And then they, so I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I can't stand behind that. Like, there's no way. I, I run around the whole stage. Like, there's no way I can stand behind that. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, how? Ooh, ooh. So I reach over and I tell the interpreter, hey, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, do I, have to, do I have to use that microphone? Like, I got to stand back there and still the whole time? And he said, uh, he kind of laughed, and he said, I actually watched you on YouTube last night. <laughs> he said, you got real quick feet. <laughs> I said, bro, you right. I do got real quick feet. He said, I got you a microphone. I'm like, thank God. Okay. So, uh, so he says, all right, it's time to go. It's time to, we're, we're, after the next song, we're going to go up there. You're going to bend down on the stage. I'm going to bless you. Then you're going to get up and sit down. We're going to sing a song and then you're going to get up and preach. That's weird, but okay. I like it. Let's do it. And uh, so the song ends. We go up there. I kneel down. He blesses me. I don't know. Hopefully it was from heaven, uh, but he, he blesses me. I get up and I sit down. We wait on a song. And during that song, I'm sitting there looking at these people, man. <laughs> They're looking at me like, what did they bring into our church? 
I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, tensions are high and I ain't even started talking yet. So I'm sitting there and my prayer when he prayed for me was, God, I already feel the tension. If you want to come in like a wind, like you did Elijah, and just, just take me on up. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. You want to do miraculous things in this church? If you do that, that's probably better than anything that I could say. It didn't happen. And so I'm sitting there thinking, man, I wish I'd have wore something elegant. <laughs> and I walk up to the pulpit and I said to them, man, y'all look good. <laughs> and they kind of laughed for just a second. And I said, uh, to be honest with you, I was, I was told last night I was supposed to come elegant. And if I'm being real with you, at my church, this is elegant. And, uh, and they, they busted out laughing for just a second. And I said to them, hey, listen, I think that if you allow him to, Satan can, he can stop you from receiving what you need to receive if, if you've been offended by my clothes. Amen. I apologize. If I would have known what I was walking into, I'd have, I'd have probably done this a little bit differently. But if you'll open up your hearts, I do believe that I have a word from God for you. Amen. And when I said that, y'all... You could just feel the tension break. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. You could feel the tension break. Not only with them, but you could feel it break with old dude. <laughs> My interpreter. And so then here's where it gets real fun. So after the tension break, he actually started laughing. Whenever I told them that I was sorry and I apologize, he started laughing. You could tell he was calming down a little bit. And then I started preaching, y'all. And he was like the, the Romanian Josh Pogue because I would come over here and I would be going and I would get passionate and I would get loud and he would be right behind me and he would have his hand going and he would get passionate and he would get loud. Then I would go this way and he'd be coming right behind me and he would get passionate and he would get loud. And then I would slow down and I would soften up and he would soften up. It was awesome. So we close out the service, and, uh, and, and, and I come down. He says, hey, there's a lot of people that want you to pray for them. Weirdest thing, y'all. In Romania, women can't preach. They also can't pray for nobody. Because I was like, hey, can I go grab my wife? She can pray for the women. I'll pray for the men. He's like, no, no. Well, all right. So then every time somebody come up, he'd make them kneel down. I'm like, man, this is awkward. I'm going down with them, bro. Like, and so we go down and pray for them. And then the funniest part was at the end of the service, Clint, one of the guys, uh, he, he knew that it was traditional. And he wanted the whole purpose of him going was he wanted to see me bomb in front of all the traditional people. And so he said, I'm going to watch this. Like, I'm, I'm going to watch the party. And so Clint walks up to the interpreter at the end of service and he says, hey, man, I got to ask, like, is that your typical kind of message that you hear on a Sunday morning? And this was so cool. Uh, George, the interpreter, he said, no, that is not at all what we typically hear, what we see on a Sunday morning, but I believe it's exactly what we needed. Amen. Isn't it cool how God works? So, so, so cool. Um, So then, just out of curiosity, my wife's question for me um, was, was peaking interest. Does Kermit hate me? Um, and so we get back to the hotel, and I walk up to Kermit, and everybody's talking about all of their experiences. And everybody heard that I was preaching at the biggest gypsy church in Europe, which I didn't know about. And so everybody's like, why'd you send him? Why'd you, you know, why'd he get to go? Uh, and I thought it was so cool. Kermit said, uh, I asked the Holy Spirit where each person was supposed to go. And he said, and I thought this was so cool. He said, the Holy Spirit said to me, Josh has an anointing to reach people that most pastors can't reach. And the gypsies are people that most pastors can't reach. I thought, man, that's cool. So in just a little bit, Christy's going to come and she's going to share some of what she got to experience while she was gone. Um, but I want you to get out your notes. I want to sh share with you my heart for just a minute. Uh, if you're taking notes... I had a huge realization while I was in Romania that I think the American church needs a wake-up call on. And um, if you're taking notes, I think probably one of the things that we take for granted most 
is exactly how precious his word is. I want you to stay with me because we hear those kind of things all the time. Like, oh, the Bible's important. The Bible's precious. The Bible's, you should know the Bible. How many of y'all have heard that 367,000 times? Are you in church? Yes, of course. Every pastor's going to say that. But for me, going to Romania was a realization of exactly how precious it is. In America, y'all, this thing is everywhere. It's literally everywhere. Like you go to a hotel room, the Gideon's got you covered. You go to Walmart, you can buy any kind of Bible that you want at Walmart. You can order one any kind of way online. Like you can get it. Hey, there's, there, people got Bible scriptures tattooed all over them. Businesses got scriptures all over them. In America, the Bible is literally everywhere. You got hundreds of church. Church is just in Lufkin. If you want a Bible in Lufkin, you can walk in the door of a church and say, hey, can I get a Bible? They're going to give you a Bible. This Bible is everywhere here. How many of you would agree? And I believe that we know that the word of God is important. I mean, we hear preached all the times. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than the sharpest of two-edged swords, cutting between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. First, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Listen, these aren't just words on a paper. This is God's love letter for us, for us to come and, and, and live our life and follow what he's given. It. Y'all, this is God's letter to us. That is so precious. Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know what that means? This right here is literally, if God's destination for my life is right here and I'm starting over there, part of the only way that I'm gonna get from over here to over there is if I break out the map and I begin to look at the map of what God has for my life. And as the map directs me, I head to the destination. Listen to me, if I'm going to Dallas, I got a GPS. If I, listen, if you're driving to New York City, if you take off and you don't have a map, what's gonna happen? You ain't making it to New York City. Not unless you're a trucker and you might can. Everybody else, us normal people, we ain't making it. You know why? Because we don't know how to get to the destination that we're heading. And this is literally just as important as your GPS is to get to New York City. If you want to get to where God has called you to go, this is key. You can't get there without the word of God. This is precious, y'all. I believe if we knew how precious his word was. And how lucky we are in America to have it so easily accessible to us that maybe instead of Bibles accumulating dust on shelves, if we knew how precious it was, how lucky we are to have it, we would probably be digging into his word and learning the word of God for the sake of just having the knowledge that is in that book. And the reason that I say that is because it hit me how precious having this so available to us is while we're in, in, in Romania. Uh, how many of you have a Bible in your home? How many of you have more than one Bible in your home? Look at that. Listen to me. Did you know in Romania it was illegal to have a Bible in your home until 1989? Y'all, that's 33 years. I think I added that, right? 33 or 34 years. That's, that means in my lifetime... It was illegal to have a Bible in Romania in my lifetime. And so what I got to hear made me realize exactly how precious us having this so easily accessible to us is. Pastor Mihai, the pastor that was over the conference that we were at, he began to tell us story after story about when he was a kid. Because when Mihai was 18 years old, if this was before the revolution of 89, when he was 18 years old, then, then, then you couldn't have a Bible. It was illegal for you to have a Bible. And, and when you were 18 years old, what happened was you were required to go into the Romanian military for two years. And Mihai said, nobody knows if anybody's a believer because it's illegal 
for us to have Christian books and, and to have a Bible. And so he said, I can remember in my mind, I began to have tears swell up in my eyes. He said, I used to take and I would keep a New Testament Bible underneath my armor and underneath my, my military clothing. And he said, sometime when I would get time away, I would go into the bathroom and I would sit on the toilet and I would look around to make sure that nobody saw me because they would turn me in and I would break open the New Testament and I would begin to read And so many times we don't ever even look at the Bible. It just accumulates dust on our shelves. And this guy, this word is so precious to him. It is so meaningful to him that even though he's at risk of going to prison, on a toilet, in a bathroom, in the military, it's so precious that he's putting his whole life at risk at 18 years old just so that he could get the knowledge that's in this word. You know why? Because he believed it was alive and powerful. Because he believed it was the roadmap. Sometimes I wonder if we actually believe that. I listen as he shared as a boy, his dad getting arrested multiple times and how the secret police would break into their home multiple times and raid their home looking for Christian books. And if they found Christian books, they would go take the books and they would take them to prison. And he said, we had up on the mantle, there was this secret stash. <laughs> Can you imagine you got a secret safe in your house? What is it that you have in your secret safe? In Romania, the most precious thing that they had in their secret safe in their house was books about Jesus and Christianity because it was so precious to them. And we just have it everywhere. Did you know that most of the Bible, well, not most, a lot of the world does not have the Bible accessible to them like we do? Did you know that still to this day, 52 countries, it's illegal to have a Bible in? How many of y'all didn't know that? Sometimes we're totally oblivious to everything else that goes on in the world, but this book is so precious that 52 countries, it's illegal for you to own this book in crazy story. We get on the airplane and the airplane is Turkish Airlines and Turkish Airlines obviously is from Turkey. And so uh, in Turkey, the most predominant religion is Islam. And so when you get on Turkish Airlines, actually Christy was the one that showed me this. It blew my mind. So you can click on movies. You can click on books to read. You know what one of the top books to read is? The Quran. You know what book you will not find on the Turkish Airlines? The Bible. It's, it's, we do not fathom how lucky we are that this book is so easily accessible to us. And so many times we're so spoiled to it that we don't even read it. Oh, I get my Bible on Sunday mornings. No, no, no. I said, this is the map for your life. As you're driving, you're only going to look at the map one day of a week. This is the map for our life. Somebody say, that's good. Why do you think that this book is illegal in 52 countries? I want you to think about that. It's powerful. Why is it illegal? There's illegal because just as much as God wants this book to get in the hands of everyone, there is an enemy that doesn't want this book to get in the hands of anyone. You know why? Because Satan knows that this is alive and it's powerful. Amen. Satan knows that this is the pathway to life. Satan knows that Jesus is the answer. So Satan is going to influence people and do everything that he can to keep God's word out of the hands of people. So in 52 countries, Satan is being successful. Jeez. Somebody say it's precious. The word that I have for you today, Clawson family, for me is that I believe if there's anything in the world that we need to do as a family, it's we need to dive deeper into the word of God. 
we need to understand how precious it is and how lucky we are to have the word of God accessible to us. And instead of our Bible just being some book up on the shelf, digging in and, and, and reading it to have it lead and guide our lives. You know, when I look at our church family, I believe that we are killing it in so many areas. You guys are awesome. We're killing it in food boxes. We're killing it in worship. We're killing it in, in loving people, feeding people, caring for the sick, inviting people to join the family of God. I, I believe that we're killing it in, in, in spiritual gifts being poured out and prophetic words and, and those things that we, we haven't seen in, in, well, since the beginning of me being a pastor over the past couple of years, we've really seen those things begin to come out. I believe that we're killing it in so many areas and God is blessing our church. But if I believe that there was anything that we're lacking in, the biggest thing, in my opinion, would be an appreciation and digging and learning and going deeper into the Word of God. So I want to challenge you this morning. Would you make a commitment today not to take your Bible for granted? Would you make a commitment today not to allow it to just sit up on the shelf? But to dig into the Word, to learn from the Word, to learn to love the Word and to allow the Word to transform you. About four weeks ago, I was giving you a memory verse. Anybody remember the memory verse? I gave you a memory verse because I said that we need to dig in and learn the, the word of God. Anybody remember it? Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, 2. Can anybody say it? Yeah, yeah. do not conform to the world, but be transformed by allowing God to renew your mind. Um, for this is his will for you. Good, pleasing, and perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have half of a person. Because <laughs> she got half of it. The, together, they almost got all of it. Uh, listen, listen, can I be real with you? Y'all, we should be learning the word. If we ask our kids in children's church to learn memory verses and we don't know any of the Bible, that's ridiculous. So I got a new memory verse for you. New memory verse for you is some of David's words about the word of God. And I love this. It's Psalms 19, 7 through 11. Here's what it says. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. This is the Bible that he's talking about, the instructions. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy. They're perfect. They're trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are clear, giving insight for the living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold. Even the finest gold, they're sweeter than honey. Even, the, even dripping from the comb. They are warning to your servant and a great reward for those who obey them. I believe that this is so important. Here we go. I'm going to do like I do the youth or the kids. First person to memorize the scripture and bring it to me. I'm going to give you 50 bucks. There's gas money. Don't be, uh -uh, don't be asking me for gas money. You learn the word. You can have it. Second two people, 25 bucks. Now, why is that? That's stupid, ain't it? It's dumb. Here's why. Because I believe it is so important for us to learn and to dig into the word of God. There you go. There's your challenge. That's what I believe that the, the Lord is challenging me with to give to you how precious his word is. And I want to invite my wife to come and she's going to share. Come on, babe. Don't look at your clock. Stop. It was the worship team's fault. <laughs> well, since I'm already out of time, uh, <laughs> I'll try to be really quick, but by hearing what Josh had to say, you can see that we had an amazing trip. We made so many memories. So many people captured our hearts, but we're so glad to be home. We missed you guys more than you can ever imagine. And being away, listening to some of the stories that the pastors we were with were telling, seeing ministry done overseas, just reiterated to us that we're blessed with the best church family that's out there. We don't tell you enough that we love you. We appreciate you. We're so thankful for you. 
We are honored that you choose to be a part of Clawson. And now that I've buttered you up, Fall Fest signups are in the floor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so when Josh asked me to come and share my biggest takeaway from the trip, it took me about 0.5 seconds to pinpoint it. I'm a kids pastor. I love kids. That's why I had four kids of my own. I uh, probably would have had more if my husband or my bank account would have allowed it. How many of you know kids are expensive? Jeez. So when we get the itinerary, I'm looking through, and I see on there that one day is for outreach to Ukrainian refugee children. Immediately, I was like, yes. This is going to be the highlight of my trip, I know. I'm super excited. Well, if you've ever been on a mission trip, you know that nothing ever goes as planned. So it kept getting pushed back. It kept getting changed. And I began to think, it's just not going to happen. We're not going to do it. On the very last day that we're at Romania, after a full day of conferences and services that night, they come to us and they say, hey, if you still are wanting to do something with the refugees, you guys can do a ice cream social after service. So we're like, okay. We go. We serve ice cream. We love on them. But to be honest, I was disappointed. The language barrier was hard, and we didn't have translators readily available. Since I wasn't able to communicate with them, I didn't feel like I connected the way I had hoped. So afterwards, they said, hey, let's take you guys on a tour. You can see what we're doing. You can see the facility. So we go, and we come to this room, and it's lined with bunk beds. And in the corner, there is some toys, and there's some kids playing. And then I noticed that there's two little boys that are playing in this tent. And, of course, the kid's pastor in me comes out. So I, like, sneak over, and I, like, hide behind the tent. I'm waiting for them to come out because I'm going to scare them. So as soon as the little heads pop out, I jump out, and I scream, and they scream, and they laugh, and we play. Well, then Josh comes in, and he said, hey, come on, we got to go. They're taking us to the next part of the tour. I wave by. I join the tour. Well, I noticed that they're following me. So I turn to Josh and I say, hey, just come get me whenever you are done. I'm going to go back in there with them. So dramatically, I turn around, I scream, I chase them. We run back in there and we play and we play and we play until all I can play is dead because I f forgot that I'm getting old and I'm fat and I'm out of shape. <laughs> Uh, Josh eventually comes back in there, and he's like, hey, we got to go. It, the tour's been over. I was like, okay. This time when I wave by, they tackle me. Hugs all around. I'm literally peeling them off of me, trying to go home. As I'm walking back to the hotel, I realized that I had spent all that time with these children, and we never exchanged one word. But so much was said. How? Because love is a universal language. And it breaks through every barrier. So the thought that I want to bring to you today is Jesus has called us to love and action. Depending on the translation that you read, the word love, it appears in the King James 310 times. It appears in the NIV 574 times. It appears in the New Living Translation 665 times. So whatever translation you're reading, that's a lot of times. I can only assume that it appears so many times because it's important to the Lord. And when you look up all these scriptures, you'll notice a common theme. And that is that love is used as a verb meaning that it's an action word. It's something that you do. It's not an endearment. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. So I want to look at two of these scriptures really quickly. Um, the first one is John 13, 34 through 35. It says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And then I want to look at Romans 5, 8. It says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us 
while we were still sinners. Love is an action. You can say it. You can write it. You can write love notes. You can text it and type it. But the words don't have power if there's not action behind them. God didn't just say, hey, Christy, I love you. That didn't change my life. God said, Christy, I love you. And so I'm going to send my son to be beaten, to be stretched wide on a cross and die so that you can have a chance to go to heaven. Even when you are in the worst pit of sin, I'm going to do that for you because I love you. And he showed me the clearest picture of what true love looks like. And he didn't even stop there. And that was enough. But no, every single day he gives me new mercies and he gives me grace and he's there beside me and he speaks to me because he loves me. And then Jesus says, love each other. Our love is gonna prove to the world that you're my disciple. Jesus did something when he gave us this commandment that the world had never seen before. He created a group that was identified by love. Skin color didn't matter. Political views didn't matter. Language didn't matter. Social class didn't matter. Culture didn't matter. What mattered was how they loved those that were around them. Before Jesus left the earth, he showed love to tax collectors, prostitutes, diseased people, poor people, widows, women, children, outcast. He challenged the culture, the customs in the society so that he could show the very least of us love, so that he can make sure that we knew that we were loved. And because he loves us, he's called us to love like him. So how do we do this? We love, even when it's inconvenient. We love when we feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We love when it hurts, when it's hard, and when it's the very last thing that we want to do. This call to love isn't something that should be taken lightly. But as Pastor Josh was saying, if we stay in the word and we pray that God will create in us a heart like his, we'll see that we become more and more like him. I'll admit, I struggle to love. Kids, yes, they're easy. Adults, y'all prove a little harder. <laughs> Youth, y'all are the hardest. <laughs> and even though sometimes I don't want to love, it's hard for me. I do want to please the Lord. I do want to be all that he's called me to be. I do want what he wants for me. And so I challenge myself to grow. And I challenge you to not take the world's definition of what love is, but as a child of God, you have a higher calling. And that calling is to love in action and to love in truth. And it's not an easy calling, and it's not a popular calling. But God didn't call us to popular and he didn't call us to easy. But what he did promise us was his presence and that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And he demonstrated on the cross his love for us. So let's love him and let's love others with all we've got. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask our worship team to come and join us up on the stage. <clears throat> Trying to figure out exactly how I want to close this out. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us as a people that our eyes would be open to the things that God needs to open our eyes to. I want to pray that, that we would not take for granted the word of God. I want, to, I want to pray that we love not with, not with just our mouths, but in every, God, that, God, that you would create that group of people here that we are known because we love people. That's what we're known by, loving people. I'm going to pray for that in just a second. I never, ever, ever want to have a service where we don't have an, 
an altar call available. And so here's what we're going to do. Altar team, would you step out and come and, and join me? Y'all, in just a few minutes, we're going to have an altar training. If anybody is going to that, I think we will either be in the youth room or fellowship hall, depending on fellowship hall. Okay, we will be in the, in the fellowship hall. I'm teaching that class if you're interested in knowing what these guys get taught. Uh, but here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. And then we're going to open up the altars. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? In just a minute, I'm going to pray. But if you're here and, and listen, don't focus on time. we got plenty of time. If you're here this morning and you need prayer, if you're here this morning and maybe you haven't been following the Lord, maybe you're not close to him, or maybe you need to, 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 um, um, to, to, to give yourself to him, get close to him. If you're here this morning and you need healing, if you're here this morning and you need any type of prayer, in just a minute when I'm done praying and I, and I dismiss, we're going to sing a song and I want to invite you to come and get the prayer that you need. But before we do that, can I, can I ask you to do me a favor? Would you just lift your hands up to heaven and I'm gonna ask that we receive. We receive what he has for us to receive today. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. God, I thank you for what you were stirring in my spirit and what you were stirring in my wife's spirit while we were gone. God, I pray for every single person that is in this room right now that we would receive exactly what we need to receive from you. Realization, Father, that your word is precious, God, and that we cannot get where we, where you want us to go, the destination that you want us to go unless we know, unless we dig into your word. Help us to, to th God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's accessible to us. I thank you, Father, for each and everything that we receive in it. God, and I pray right now as our hands are lifted, I pray that you would help us to receive your love. And as we receive it, I pray that you would help us to give your love even when it hurts, even when it's inconvenient, even when we're tired and we don't feel like it. Help us to pour out and give your love. Help us to be a group of people that are known by the way that we love. In just a second, we're going to sing a song together. And if you need to go, you can go. If you want to head to that class, you can head to that class. But listen to me. If you're here and you need prayer, if you're here and you want somebody to join with and pray for you, we have a wonderful trained team that would love to pray for you. Do not leave this morning without getting what you need to get from the Lord. Let's sing this song. And if you need prayer, would you step out and come right now?